Hello, and welcome to ATP Report on this very special anniversary week of 9-11. We have two very special expert guests I'm very honored to introduce to you today. First, Claire Lopez is an internationally recognized expert on terrorism. She's a writer and a frequent expert commentator on that subject an extensive background uh, representing the United States around the world, uh, especially being overseas with the CIA. Uh, our second terrific guest is Dr. Bill Warner. He's a former college professor, a prolific writer, and the creator of the theory of political Islam. Welcome, Claire, and welcome, Bill. Thank, Thank you, Barry. Bill. You have a new video out about the importance of language and correct terminology, correct? Yes. Why do we say radical Islam or jihadi Islam? Is that PR? And when you say, when you say radical Islam, you're using a political science word. What I use, I say that the language to describe Islam should come from Islam. And the most important word we need to add to our language is kafir, unbeliever. <clears throat> I did a counting in the Quran and Arabic of all the uses of the word kafir. And there were some 400 uses of the word kafir. And in those 345 times, it means kafir is that who is despised. So therefore, <clears throat> we need to understand if you're dealing with Zudi Jasser, for instance, that in his eyes, I'm a kafir. And when you see what a kafir is, it's filthy, hated, lower than an animal, can be enslaved, raped, imprisoned, tortured. If we understand that in the eyes of Islam, we are all kafirs, it changes how we see Islam and it changes how, it changes how we see Muslims. Because standing behind this is the fact that there are 13 verses in the Quran which say that a Muslim is never the true friend of a kafir. So we need to start using the right words. We need to use words like Medina Islam, which refers to the Jihad Islam. We need to start using the words. That, look, all I'm saying is they have their, all their own words for this. Why can't we use them? Because when we use them, we get understanding the real truth of Islam. So therefore, I, I, I argue that we need to use the right words because fuzzy yeah. thinking. Let me give you an example. People talk about Islamist. What is Islam? Islam is the doctrine found in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. So an Islamist is one who believes in the Quran, Sirah, and the Hadith. We just said he's a Muslim. That's all he is. So the words that we use need to contain real weight. They need to have a real basis, not from sociology, not from political science, but from Islam. Is this such a radical idea? Let me hit you both with a really important question, and then Claire, you can kick it off on the answer. So going back to 9-11, those 19 hijackers that literally changed the world forever, were those radical Islamists? Were they jihadis or were they just Muslims following the commandments from their holy books? You know, turn this around. Would we ever in our wildest imagination called Christians who try to obey the Ten Commandments, do their best, follow the Gospels, follow the example of Jesus Christ, or Jews uh, who try to follow uh, the teachings of their faith and obey, actually it's 613 commandments they have out of the Talmud, um, would we ever dream of calling those radical uh, Christianists, radical extremist Christianists because they follow their faith? Would we ever in our crazy imagination call them radical extremists, what, Jewists, because they try to obey uh, the commandments of their faith? No, it's absurd. And so should it be when we're talking about devout, faithful, practicing Muslims. If they obey and try to obey the commandments of their faith, and as Bill makes this point so well often, follow the example, emulate the example of their founder, Muhammad, why would we call that radical or extreme? The definition of those words is deviation from the norm. But if the norm is obedience to the commandments of Islam, then this is not a deviation from the norm at all. But what I was gonna say also, uh, bringing this back to an earlier part of our discussion here uh, about the language, a perfect segue, what Bill just said about using the correct words. And that is that Beginning in uh, the period right after 9-11, in the George W. Bush administration, 
and then certainly carrying forward through the uh, administration of uh, President Barack Obama, uh, something occurred that we have taken to calling the Great Purge. The Great Purge began under George W. Bush. And what it was, as, as we've mentioned before, is a scrubbing of the language, uh, official US government language, uh, verbal and written, um, throughout the entire United States government in that period of time, uh, post 9-11, now coming on 19 years hence. Words like Islam, Jihad, Caliphate, Sharia, were all deemed by the Muslim Brotherhood advisors that George W. Bush and certainly Barack Obama brought in as advisory teams to every cabinet department uh, relevant, you know, Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, the intelligence community, those Muslim Brotherhood advisors said these words were offensive, take them out. And our government acquiesced and said, okay, if, if, if they're offensive to you, we won't speak them anymore, we won't write them. That is what happened to Bill and other, other uh, knowledgeable uh, uh, instructors like Robert Spencer, John Guandolo, Steve Coughlin, and others, Bill Gothrop, they, along with their teachings, their, their, their syllabuses, their PowerPoints, their, their presentations, were all purged from the US government, the Great Purge, we call it. And unfortunately, to this date, uh, President Trump has not even begun to reverse that, that situation. Now, granted, he's got a few other things on his plate and has ever since he came to office, but this is important and the Great Purge must be reversed if we are ever to confront uh, the threat of, of Islamic, uh, the Islamic movement as they call it themselves. I absolutely agree. Why did we agree to take them all out? Claire, Bill? Well, uh, because, uh, you know, as we've said, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood had infiltrated America, American society, and the American government way long before 9-11. We'll recall, of course, they're founded in Egypt in 1928. They came to the United States. Muslim brothers came to the United States just after nine, or just after World War II. Uh, we can see a picture of them in the Oval Office with President Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1952, a, a delegation from Egypt led by um, the son-in-law of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Syed Ramadan. Uh, that photo, black and white, is in the Eisenhower Oval Office, 1952. That's when they came here. They've had a long head start on infiltrating our society and our government, academia, media, government, faith communities, etc. So by the time we get, you know, even to the uh, the Clinton administrations of of the 1990s, and certainly after 9/11, uh, the game was up. The jig was up. They already controlled um, all of our uh, national security agencies and the leadership of them, as well as places like academia and faith communities and so forth, the workplace society. But in terms of the government, they were already embedded in the Clinton years, deep inside of our government, and they've never been rousted out, either as appointees or as advisors sometimes. Uh, they're still there. I mean, take the Department of Homeland Security uh, and their um, as they call it, countering violent extremism uh, advisory committee, right? And who's on that committee? Well, under the Obama administration, uh, the uh, Secretary of Department of Homeland Security was Janet Napolitano. So she she brought in Imad, um, uh, the Imam Mohammed Majid, for example, the uh, Muslim Brother um, head of the Adams Center, Al Dulles Area Muslim Society Center, out near Dulles Airport in Virginia. Imam Muhammad Majid to this day leads prayers for the Trump administration at their national prayer days, to this day. This is what I mean. The Great Purge has never been reversed. Um, these influences of the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamic movement, that's what they call themselves, have never been rooted out to this day. Thousands died. The world changed forever. And I don't just mean going through the airport where it used to be 10 minutes and now it's two and a half hours, but literally the world changed and all over the world because of what happened 19 years ago this week. 
What is the one thing each of you would identify as the biggest change in the world because of 9-11? Bill, you go first. Well, I have an odd suggestion. Something that has happened that has been an unseen revolution that has happened in the intellectual world. After 9-11, after a lot of scholars put themselves to work to make the doctrine of Islam clear and easy to understand for anybody. Anybody who wants to can now understand the doctrine of Islam. We have an entire grassroots organization that has put this together. This will have long-term effects, which we cannot measure. So I have a degree of optimism here. For the first time in human history, it is now possible for anybody to understand the doctrine of Islam if they merely want to. And this will have long-term effects, which we cannot anticipate now. So that's my note of optimism, the change that's unspoken and unnoticed. I, I love it because the best counter to any movement is education. If you don't know what's coming and you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know why it's coming at you, you're a victim. If you're proactive and you understand it, you can prepare, defend, and be ready to make things better or at least enhances your survival. Claire, what would, you, what would your takeaway from 9-11 be? How did the world change? I, I would agree completely with what Bill just said and maybe take another step onward from that. Um, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and the others uh, did uh, achieve what they set out to do, which was to rouse up the forces of Islam since the days of colonialism that had been at least somewhat uh, suppressed. But that then gave the world the opportunity to see once again what Islam really is about. Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, all of these groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Taliban, etc., cetera, um, gave the modern world in an age of instantaneous communication and, and uh, the internet, the ability, just as Bill is saying, uh, not just through those who now teach it and explain it and write and, and speak about it, but through the actions of these Islamic Jihad groups themselves to see what horrors uh, they inflict on the world with Jihad and their intent to conquer and subjugate. Well, I appreciate both of your optimistic, educationally minded um, takeaways. It makes me feel a little better, uh, especially on such a somber week uh, as we are now experiencing. I wanna thank both of you for coming on today uh, in light of the fact that America will be remembering our dead and how the world changed uh, 19 years ago. Uh, Bill, tell people how they can find out about you and what you do, would you please? I have a website called politicalislam.com. You can see my videos, newsletters, books, the whole nine yards. And by the way, I don't really sell books. I teach, I use cell educational systems. There's designs for you to educate yourself so that you too can know what Muhammad said and did and understand the mind of Allah. Excellent. How about you, Claire? Where can people find you? Well, I don't yet have a website, but uh, you can find much of my writing, my videos, uh, and other presentations online at a couple of different websites. One is at theunitedwest.com, uh, and its partner, shariacrimestoppers.com. Um, I'm also posted up at the Citizens Commission on National Security, um, many of my uh, presentations are cross-posted uh, with Brandon Howes at worldviewweekend.com. Uh, and I am online on social media uh, at um, Claire M. Lopez on Twitter, on Parlay, and on Facebook, same by name. Um, and eventually, I uh, hope to have a website. And both of you are on americantruthproject.org and uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, for those viewers out there that have not yet subscribed to our text message alert system, I would encourage you to take out your cell phone and type the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be automatically subscribed to our free service that gets you brilliant insight like Dr. Bill and Claire's uh, joining us today on this show and all of our future stuff. We never charge for content. If you're a little more old fashioned, you can go to americantruthproject.org and sign up to be on our mailing list here, there and you'll get the same stuff for free in your email. 
for ATP Report. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Barry Newsbaum.